Okay, in this go round, we're going to go through the the reading again, and then I'm going to make some remarks about the importance of this kind of stuff for hermeneutics, because it's really important. All right, first I'm going to read the translation in Greek, and then you just follow along. You can also, of course, download this document from the video description. Ais huio tesian ti Jesu Christu, ais epides osan di anes teseos Jesu Christu et nekron, ais saton kata ten yudokian tu telematos autu, ais epides osan di anes teseos Jesu Christu et nekron, ais kleron nomian aftarton kamian ton kamaran ton teteremenen En uranes es humas, ai se pae non, doxis es haritus autu, en haris, es haris tos er gemas. En agapamen noi, en noi ekomen, ten apolutrosen, tie tu haimatos autu, ten afeisin, ai scleronomian, aftar ton, kamian ton. Camaranton, te teremenen, en uranes es humas, ten napolutrosen, di, di etu hematos autu, ten afeisi. Sorry, I keep scrolling up when I hit is haritosen hemas. I have so much trouble saying that, and I don't know why. Is haritosen hemas. That's how you ought to say it. Is haritos in himas, or is haritos in himas? Take your pick. The, the the little accent marks here are things people put there, and I don't necessarily agree that they're right because they don't fit. They don't fit the cadence sometimes, so I just go with the cadence. <clears throat> if you disagree, well, that's up to you. All right, now. Why is this so important, hermeneutics? Take a good long look at what you're seeing on screen here. Okay? When people got these letters, the meter told them where to cross-reference other scripture. They counted syllables to know that they memorized properly. That was easier than carrying around a lot of heavy, smelly parchments or heavy, smelly scrolls because things molded easily in the ancient world and they were heavy <coughs> so it wasn't it wasn't that people were illiterate if anything even the poorest person was more literate than we are today because th their entertainment was the language so they learned it just for fun just so they could have something to do while they were doing their boring lives all right so people knew how to read and write but it was a pain in the neck to carry writing around with you. So you memorized it said, and you got real adept at arithmetic. You got real adept at counting syllables. And so you counted syllables to make sure that you memorized properly. And everybody in classical Greek, all the classical Greek scholars, and hopefully most of the Jewish scholars, they all know this. So why aren't we applying standards we know ran across everywhere in the ancient world in every language. Why aren't we applying those same standards to the Bible? If we did, we'd realize that this is what's going on. Okay? So if you're like in seminary or something and thinking about, well, what am I gonna do as a dissertation? Pick something like this maybe, if you're interested. And if you're watching this, I have to presume you're interested. This would make a great subject for a dissertation. Meter in the Bible. It's been debated for 300 years since the 1700s from what I can find. And the, the mainstream scholarship, well, is bifurcated. Half the scholars think that there's no such thing as Bible Hebrew meter. And the other half are trying to contend that there is, but they don't know what kind it is. Well, here's what kind it is. If you counted your syllables like the ancients had to do, you'd have spotted it. Okay, it's in sevens in the Bible. They parse, they parse clauses and stuff like that in sevens because they're embedding a little calendar in there. 
okay? So you not only so you can make the words to your time. See? I mean, these words are really sharp, okay? Into airship, sonship through Jesus Christ. Oh, that sounds really nice. Okay, but how do you use it? Well, if you knew the meter, you'd know that this particular clause is applying to the period from 95 to 105 AD, when Paul is going to be dead. So if you're alive during that time, this is going to be very relevant to the time you live then. I mean, it's, it's timeless. Okay? It's got that meaning, too. That's, of course, the first meaning, which everybody knows, and everybody goes to sleep over. Yeah, but it stops being sleepy when you're between 94, 95 and 105 AD, and this is what you need to remember. And why was that so important? Oh, that was the period of the adoptive emperors. Remember, Paul is dead when this happens. He's being prophetic here. And Peter is writing back to Paul, knowing that prophecy. Okay? In fact, the thing that's so astonishing about this is the guy who's going to kick off the adoptive emperors is Vespasian. And at the time, Peter's writing Vespasian and Titus are in front of Jerusalem besieging it. So God had to give Peter the understanding of what this was going to be before it happened. Okay? Everybody's always saying, where's the prophecy about church? Well, it's right here. And Peter knew that. So he's telling you, hi, from 95 to 122, he's going beyond. From 95 to 122, not just 105. Also remember this. Your ever-living hope, confident expectation, through his resurrection, he's raised, so you will be also, Jesus Christ from the dead. Now that sounds real syrupy in English. Yeah, and it's it's got a whole lot more meaning when you know that, by the way, you're going to need desperately to remember this between 95 and 122. Why is that? Well, Peter, of course, foreknew this, just as Paul did. During the period of the adoptive emperors, that was when per Christian persecution began. It began under Trajan. Okay, Trajan was one of the adoptive emperors. It began under Trajan. Nerva was kind of nice about it, but Trajan was not so nice. And that was when, you know, if you were a Christian and you admitted it, then you could get you could get killed. You were subject to the penalty of death. And that's where that stupid letter from Justin Martyr comes in. If Justin Martyr really wrote that, he was an idiot. He begged Trajan. He went to Trajan and asked Trajan to persecute him for being a Christian. You don't do that. That's dumb. You don't you don't tempt somebody else, namely Trajan, to sin by doing what they tell you not to do. You were allowed to be a Christian if you just shut up about it. But Justin Martyr was proud of his Christianity. He was an idiot. He was a baby. And he thought, oh, I'm going to be martyred now. And he spent six months writing letters to everybody he knew about how he was going back to Rome to be martyred. It only took 20 days to go from where he visited Trajan to Rome. But he took six months about it and wrote everybody. He was a jerk. If you like Justin Martyr, something's wrong with you mentally. Okay? Just read the guy and you'll see what a self-righteous jerk he was. So that's why Peter's writing this. He knows persecution's going to come during this time. He knows there's going to be idiots like Justin Martyr. Okay? So you remember this. You don't, go ch you don't go chirping or making an issue of the fact that you're a Christian. You just remember these words. This is your inheritance. See, because he's playing off Paul. All right? See how vital that is? Just these two. Just this, this first two. See the importance to hermeneutics? The church fathers obviously didn't know anything about this. That's how dumb they were. I mean, they didn't know anything about the meter? How could they have been so dumb? Look at how bald it is. See, you got ice and ice. Peter's interleaving his ice claws with Paul's ice clauses. We got Paul ice claws here, Paul ice claws here. Peter sticks his in the middle, and he makes sure you know that because he meters his syllables. This starts literally at 103 to 122. I mean, 90, 95 to 122. 
okay? How come the church fathers didn't know this? It's embarrassing. Nobody should have any respect for the church fathers. They're good because they wrote in Greek of the time, and you can help, you know, that that's helpful. But that's about all they're good for. The content of their writing is sheer drivel. Okay, they quoted some verses, so you can get some sense of what verses they thought were true at the time. But they didn't even understand what they quoted. They were jerks. Total jerks. Yeah, and you need to remember that because you're going to be betwixt and between. On the one hand, you got the Roman Empire to worry about, and on the other hand, you got all these Christian self-righteous babies to worry about. So you just you just cling to the your fact that you're an heir during the time of the adopted emperors, and that you got an ever-living, confident expectation because Jesus Christ is resurrected from the dead. And you say, well, that's really too simple. No, it's not. Not when you're under pressure. When you're under pressure, this is really vital information to remember. Okay, and that goes all the way through 122 AD. Okay? So now, all right, so it's Aisel Pides Osan, Dianus Taceos, Jesu Christu et Necron, and to hope ever living through his resurrection, Jesus the Christ from the dead. All right? So now we got Aiskaton, Aisalton Kata. Why is Peter? Why is this in or leave next? Because this is covering the same period. See, you can't say both words at the same time, so you have to go antiphonal, all right, to cover the same period. So, in, into whom, for his own delight, his own will and purpose. This has particular relevance because at this point right here, Trajan dies. That's 117. Hadrian takes his place. Hadrian will undo everything Trajan accomplished. Okay, and that's true every single time you find the Ada and Telematos in the wall. Some emperor dies, and the next emperor undoes what the previous emperor had accomplished. Uh, and, and what the previous emperor wanted. Second time this occurs, it's with Macrinus, and he had nominated his son, who was an infant, to be <clears throat> the next emperor, and he ends up getting killed with his infant, so basically everything he wanted gets undone by his successor, who is also dead. Okay, because he wanted his successor to be alive. Right? And then the third time, it's between Diocletian and Constantine. 316 A.D. And it's 316, not 313. Timothy Barnes is wrong. I explain why in my appendix to of the Ephesians 1 report stock. Okay? So, to telematos out to, of his official will and purpose, of his own will and purpose, I mean, I'm hoping you'll get the idea that this is official. But telema, telema means official will, legal will. Okay? So, that's really important to know for that period of time which ties exactly overlapping this period of time. See how important the meter is to know? You're getting a real clear sense of what Peter means by what he writes. But if all you're doing is looking in the English, into whom we are, prayers on the light, that's Paul, of his own will and purpose, you wouldn't even know that Peter was referencing this. You wouldn't know. All you'd see is, into a living hope of Jesus Christ from the dead, oh yeah. I hear that every Sunday and I don't even care what it means anymore. See the vital difference to hermeneutics? What would Christians do if they understood what Peter was actually saying? That he was tying it to Paul and that all this is tied to a specific time in yet future history that we can prove today actually occurred? I would think that people would have a lot more faith in the Bible and in God, don't you? It's really criminal that we don't know this. Okay? And then he wraps his phrase around again, another eyes clause. I said, Peter Zosan, Dianus Teseos, and to hope ever living through his resurrection, Jesu Christu ac Necron. Only this time, this time, he's bridging to 140 AD when Hadrian himself, too, will be dead. Hadrian will be dead. All right, and that's actually coming up down here in Paul. But he's going to insert more before we get back to Paul. He wants you to remember there's a time bridge here. Get out of Dodge. If you're still in Jerusalem, which you'd be stupid to be in Jerusalem. Peter himself was out of Jerusalem by the time he writes. If you're stupid enough to be in Jerusalem, get out. 
and this is what you remember. You have a confident expectation. You don't need to be in Jerusalem in order to be holy. Okay, and besides, there's going to be a pig temple there by 140 AD. All right, which you already got that from Paul. In other words, there's, Jerusalem is going down. Paul's meter, see, this is a 7 to 141 and 7. Really bad time coming here. Get out. All right, so that's what he's reminding you of in advance. And the 140 we had a lot of meaning to Jews because that was the number of years between the downfall of the first temple and the completion of Jerusalem's walls under Nehemiah. They kept records like that. They knew the dates like that. So he's telling them, hi, there's a future period coming up. It's going to have the same characteristics, which means no temple is going to be there. There's not even going to be a Jerusalem by 140 AD. Get out. And they had already gotten that from Paul down here. <clears throat> but Peter's presaging it because he's still hooked on to 122. And now he's going to branch to 140. So he nests the second of Pinon by doing this. All right? Then we come in, the, the nesting continues because now he's going to carry it forward because it goes all the way to 169, his second benchmark. So that's why you got Aiskleron Nomia, Naftarton, Kamianton, Kamaranton, Teteremenen, and Uranus is Humas. Okay? And so that's nesting the second Epina Anaphora. And the Eudokian, the I should have mentioned this. In Paul, the Eudokian Anaphora is about how, how, Christian, how to have Christian autonomy away from other Christians who are apostate and away from Rome. That's the history he's going to trace with this anaphora. Every time he um, repeats it, okay, he's basically bookended periods of history, and he's and he's using those periods of history as those histories periods of history unfold. You'll know what to do, and in retrospect, you learn the lesson of history if you didn't learn it at the time. And this lesson of history, Eudokion, God's good pleasure, God's good pleasure is that you have autonomy, that you be free. Galatians 5.1, it's for freedom that Christ has set you free. Okay, but the second, the apinon, praise, the praise of God, is his word being preserved. See, if there's no word preserved, there's, who's going to be there to praise him? How can you praise God without his word? You can't. Hebrews 11.6, it's impossible to praise him apart from Bible doctrine. The word faith, though, should be, should be translated Bible doctrine. Okay, so that's why... Peter is embedding his text here as a sort of prologue to the second anaphora, the Apinon anaphora that Paul had developed and that had been out for a good 10 years when Peter writes. So he's expecting the audience to know this. And I'm really grateful he did because I was worried that when I parsed it like this, that I was somehow, you know, crazy. I was just going by the sound. I was going by the sound and the the, the the syllable counts, and I needed something to check it. And I didn't know Peter would be the guy that would prove it okay. So I feel really good about it now. Isopino, all right? So that's the next period. So we got 122 to 140 branched, and then we're coming back full circle from 123 to 169, and then ensconced in that, he goes back to Paul. Okay. See? He goes back to Paul. Isaac Binon, starting in 1-6, and most, not all, of 1-7. The only two words that are left out of 1-7 are ten, uh, ton paraptomen, which we don't need to understand the meaning. Okay, so from 123. To 147, here's the Pauline text. From 148 to 169, when Lucius Verus dies, he was co-emperor with Marcus Aurelius. That's Paul's text. And it it's basically ensconced. And to be, you know, this is to be read as an overlay to Paul's text. All right? But the first time he does it, he puts the whole text inside. See, this is like a bookend right here. This is a bookend. 
All right. And then here's the text inside the bookend that he's bookending in Paul. All right. And then, see, let me get rid of the status bar. All right. So you can see it full, more fully. All right. So you can see this. Here's the bookend in Peter. And here's the bookend in Peter again. Between is Paul, covering the same period. All right? So in Peter, you read that first, and then it's closed off. This is what an anaphora is. It's nested. This is the second anaphora, the apinon anaphora, nested inside the Eudokian anaphora. So Peter's basically reminding the reader of that fact by the way he handles the text here. And you know that's what he's doing again because of the syllable counts. If you don't know the syllable counts, you don't know what he's doing. You don't know he's doing all this. So Peter's meaning here is real specific to an actual period of time. All right? And that's the same practice that's been followed ever since Moses in Psalm 90. And we don't know anything about it in hermeneutics. We don't know that this exists at all. So there's 19,222 different interpretations of the Bible because we don't know what the Bible writers are really trying to say. And we don't know that because we don't know the meter. I'm, I'm sorry if this is turning into something of a rant, but you know it's really pitiful that 2,000 years have passed and we don't know this. So Peter's sandwiching in Ephesians in here between two iterations of the same verse covering the same syllables and that's how come you know he's sandwiching them. All right? I showed that before in the Peter's meter section. All right? So he's sandwiching it. So then what period is this? All right, from 123 to 169, you're looking at... Um, you know, coming out of the adoptive emperors and going into the so-called golden age, according to Roman historians, which was the time of Antoninus Pius and Marcus Aurelius. That's the movie Gladiator starring Russell Crowe. That's basically what this movie was based on that time period. Okay, it was, it was specifically a sort of gossipy idea that um, Marcus Aurelius was killed by Commodus. That didn't happen in history. Okay, it really didn't. But Marcus uh, Commodus was a really, you know, sick guy. But he was a very young child when um, Marcus Aurelius died. Here we're taught we're looking at 20 years prior, almost 20 years prior to Marcus Aurelius's death, when his his adoptive brother, because he was the they were the last of the adoptive emperors, when his adoptive brother Lucius Verus dies, and Lucius Verus was mostly in Syria playing, being a playboy. And that sort of countered a lot of the, what would have been um, persecution of the Jews and Christians in the eastern part of the Roman Empire. Because he was too busy, he didn't care. Okay, but Marcus Aurelius wanted to return to Roman purity. And so there was a certain amount, not a lot, there was a certain amount of persecution. Most of the persecution Christians suffered was because they were so obnoxious. And the crowds just persecuted them, and then the Roman government just let it happen. Okay. But that's what you need to remember now, is that you're going to be living in a time when everybody's going to be saying, Oh, Rome this, Rome is glorious, Rome is great, Rome is good. And one of the things that, that when you were in the Roman Empire, and you did something really great, they held something called a triumph. And then you rode in at the head chariot, and there was a, a slave st you know, standing in the chariot with you. And the whole time everybody was cheering you and you're riding down you know, the, the parade route, the slave kept saying to you, Sic transit gloria mundi, Sic transit gloria mundi. The glory of the world is fading away. So now do you understand why Peter is saying this? Entrance into possession that can't die, can't spoil, can't fade away. No Sic transit gloria mundi for you. Because you're under God's guarding in the heavens for you all. You're going to need to remember that because these were the glory days of Rome. Okay, and you would begin to feel like maybe your faith was no good because you're a persona non grata. 
<laughs> Maybe it was all a lie. Maybe it was all a fairy tale. And you need to remember these, these words at that time. It was really important to remember. See, this is historical information that we don't know. It's prophetical historical information we don't know. And at the same time, this was when all the crappy people, the church fathers, started to rise, writing their stupid treatises. Okay? Really, really stupid stuff. And they made Christianity look bad. They appealed to Caesar. They did all kinds of stupid things. Just read the church father writings for the period. I indexed them. Uh, to this period, I indexed them in uh, Ephesians 1 read parse doc. Okay? Then you come here, and of course we're going back to Paul. And that's covering the first half of this period. Okay, this is 123. See, 123 to 169. Okay, so now we got our parenthesis. That's acting like a bookend or a parenthesis. And then this is the text that you're supposed to be thinking about in Paul for the first half. Okay, which is basically from 123 to 147. And in particular, between 141 and 147, that's going to matter because that's when, you know, Aeolia Capitolina gets built in 140. The Bar Kokhba Rebellion started in 132. All right. And you're going to remember that you're graced out because you're, you're being caused to go out. And you maybe you're caused to go out of Jerusalem, but you're inside the Beloved. See how clever that is? That's all prophetic. It's all historical. It's all demonstrated and provable now. And the people who got these verses when they were alive at that time, hopefully their parents passed it down to them and they knew what to do. Get out. You see how important this is? See how the whole meaning of what is otherwise syrupy text in Ephesians and 1 Peter, see how the whole meaning becomes very real, very tangible, very physical, very rooted. And yeah, you're going to be rem remembering what sounds like syrupy text on the surface, but it's keyed to very specific times. So you're seeing prophecy fulfilled in your lifetime. I mean, everybody wants proof of God, right? Well, how, can you ask for more proof than this? Yeah, and whom were, were holy graced out? Yeah, at the time you're getting out. You're holy graced out at the time you're getting out. And won't be allowed back in because Jews weren't allowed into... You know, Jerusalem, it was no longer called Jerusalem. It was the Aelia Capitolina, pig temple. Okay, but you're his temple now, inside the beloved. He's inside the temple above. Okay, that's what the book of Hebrews is going to be about, which wraps itself around Peter. You're inside the beloved. He's inside the temple. Okay? I, I don't know, could this be more poignant? All right? And then you can understand why this ends up being so triumphant. And right here is 169 AD. <clears throat> Peter is cutting that off because his meter is ending at 169. So you don't need the last two words in Paul. Ton paraptomen. Peter will pick up those words in later verses. But right now we're finishing at 1 Peter 1 4. And that's where this ends. To make a song out of just that part. Okay? Now, at 169, between 148 and 169, you, you had gotten out of Jerusalem, but you're in other parts of the Roman Empire, maybe. You're going to need to remember this. Because the blood's going to start spilling. You know, when all of Jerusalem got raised, you think that was all that happened? That, oh, well, Jerusalem got raised and everybody else is safe? No, uh-uh. Since Jerusalem got got raised, that was as if, as it were, permission. Official, as it were, permission from the Roman Empire that, yeah, it's okay to persecute Christians and Jews wherever they are. Because Rome stamped out Jerusalem. So anywhere the people of Jerusalem or the people who believed in the Christ of Jerusalem are located, well, gee, now we can have, we can attack them. It's okay. So what are you going to need to remember? 
when your blood is about to be spilled, we have redemption through his blood. My debt is canceled. Yeah, and your life might be canceled also. See, this stops being just nice words on a page. It becomes real meaningful when it's basically describing your life at the time. Via his blood. Yeah, because your blood's about to be spilled. The debt's canceled. The debt against those who are killing you, too. So you don't have to be angry at them. You just go home. All right, now, I don't have much proof of any, you know, bloody persecutions, but they did occur. They were sporadic, and they were usually started by the populace. And you can see why the populace would start them. Oh, Jerusalem went down. Oh, you're from Jerusalem? Well, the Rome put down Jerusalem, so you must be no good. That means that we can do all kinds of nasty things to you and get away with it. Won't be the first time that stuff has happened in history. Okay, you see how meaningful this is? Okay, okay, so now we're coming from 169. Um, this is where it ends at 169. But that was the interlock from 123, literally to 151, and 151 ended here. Okay, so if you wanted, you could like exclude all this if you wanted. I'm not sure that Peter means to do that because it looks like he's creating two refrains. So I stuck it in there. If you think this shouldn't belong and you just want to leave it, see this is syllable 151 right there. And no I That's 151. This is six syllables. De Napolu Trosin. Alright? If you want to say, well, Brandon, I think I'm gonna cut this out of here. Okay, then cut it out. In any event, he has to pick up this again because he's doing the bridge thing from 151 to 169. So after Ennoi Ekelman, he's got to pick this up and stick it right after this. Maybe I'll do that. Maybe I'll fix it. Okay. He's got to. He's got to play out all the way to 169. So, <clears throat> I clear on the me, and here it is, the refrain, going all the way to 169. The thing, I, I think he means us to go all the way to 169 in Paul, and then come back, pick up at 151, and go all the way to 169 in his own. I think he means to do that. But, the other thing you can say is you append this back, and you got Tena Polutros in from Paul again, going all the way to 169 as a second refrain tied to the Petrine refrain. And the reason that makes so much sense is that he's picking it up for one thing at 151, which lays a kind of emphasis on all this. All right, and number two, the meaning of the words. We have redemption, our debt is now canceled. Okay, that's why we can enter into possession, can't die and have all that. In other words, that was how we started it. Remember, that was the other refrain. See? Because he resurrected from the dead. Well, what did he do to die? Paid for our sins. Alright, so this is feeding back to the first refrain. And this is feeding from the first refrain. So, it makes sense to argue that it ought to be repeated here in Paul. Now if you wanted to, you could just cut this out and just just cut that out, just remove it. And then you have this and then you have this closing with Paul. You could argue that too. I, I'm arguing that you want to double it. Okay? And you know, if you think that that's seriously wrong, please tell me why in the comments. So that's basically the point here is that hermeneutically we get a real firm sense of what Peter's talking about, who he's talking to, why he's saying what he's saying. And the most important thing about it is we know when he's writing, and he's writing in light of the upcoming destruction of the temple. That's why he talks about living stones and priesthood in the rest of his letter. And that's why he's writing in a hurry. 
because he is writing in a hurry. The writing style is very hasty. And the, the scholars have a lot of problem with Peter's writing style because he makes up words. He likes to make up words. And he likes to use words in funky order. All right? And they think that that's because he was uneducated. No. It's because he's creative. And by the way, he wrote under the, Sp the Holy Spirit. So instead of assuming that Peter didn't know what he was doing and yet call it a you know, canon, why not expect that maybe God had a particular reason for the way Peter worded his words? And as you can see here, there is a reason. And if there's a reason in this section, wouldn't you think the rest of the reason, the rest of the letter has reasoning in it? Anyway, I'm sorry, I'm on my soapbox because I'm tired of hearing Bible be bashed. So if you got any questions, let me know.